What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. We're in a bit of a rough streak right now, 15 and 16 last week, only 52 and 55 over the last four weeks after a really hot start to the season. So let's try and right the ship this week and we will start things off with our boy, Nico Collins. We're getting Nico Collins higher than 53 and a half receiving yards. He's got a 19.6% target share on the season and an insane 8 18.9 yards per reception that is obviously going to regress that's going to come down throughout the season but it shows that he's not getting 19.6 percent of targets close to the line of scrimmage he's getting them deep downfield that's obviously going to help us if he has a bad game only catches two or three he can still go higher than 53 and a half this week he faces a panthers defense that's a positive matchup for everyone all positions doesn't matter how you look at it. Uh, yards per reception allowed, catch rate, pass defense DVOA. Look at any metric that you want. The Panthers are a plus matchup for everyone. Uh, so while we look at the game script and we're like, okay, this could also be a spot where the Texans will probably win. Uh, they'll probably be in a winning game script, a positive game script, meaning potentially fewer pass attempts. We're also expecting them to be highly efficient on offense. And if they get up big like that, it's at least relatively unlikely they didn't do so off of defensive touchdowns, off of interceptions where they have the ball inside like the 10-yard line. Like the most likely outcome is if they get up by multiple scores, that they drove down the field effectively, in which case they got a ton of yards. Nico can hit the higher there. He also has at least 80 receiving yards in four of six weeks. So in this matchup, he's going to hit 54 more than 50% of the time. Again, the biggest risk here is that they get up big, but for a team to get up big, you have to march down the field multiple times. He's their most likely player to allow them to march down the field. And so I really think in any game script, he's very likely to go higher than 53 and a half. My second favorite is certainly a scary one, but it's Tua under 278 and a half passing yards. No quarterback has thrown for that much against New England this season. And the game script should be pretty positive for Miami. So it's unlikely they lean past him in the fourth quarter in the big one here is that it's unlikely they're forced to go extremely pass heavy in a comeback effort. When we see these huge games from Tua and 278 is a huge number. That's a very, very high total for a quarterback. When we see these massive games, most of the time that comes in games where it's very high scoring. It's like 31 to 34. Both teams are really pushing it. They fall behind and they throw it at a very high rate to catch up. It's not as much in the games where they get up quickly and they sustain a lead because they're a very good running team, right? New England's not good. New England's probably not going to score 30 points. And there's probably not going to be a point in the game where New England is up, say, 14 points and really forces Miami to be like, okay, let's abandon the ground game and now let's throw it. The odds are New England's going to fall behind in this game. I don't remember exactly what the spread is, but it's around nine, nine and a half. I think my model has it at 11 points. Like Miami's probably going to win here. They're probably going to look good, but two, he has to hit 279 yards. That is a massive number. You can have a very good game and still be lower than that. And it's the second divisional game uh, against a team that has faced you know, elite quarterbacks all season, right? New England has the hardest schedule in the NFL. They faced really good quarterbacks besides basically Zach Wilson. And so for them to have faced that, to have never allowed a quarterback to go higher than this total and for many of them to be well under this total. And for this to be the second time you're facing them in division, which is typically more difficult for quarterbacks that second time around, Yes, he can go higher, but it's unlikely. It's definitely not going to happen more than 50% of the time. And I would say you probably want to correlate it with Tyreek Hill. You probably want to go all in because if Tyreek Hill does hit for a 60 or 70 yard play, well, now we have an outcome where it's much more likely that Tua you know, goes over this number. And so 
if you're going to take lower on 278.5, you should probably just say, okay, well, New England has been shutting down opposing wide receiver ones, facing phenomenal every single week. They're facing incredible wide receiver ones, and they're doing a very good job at slowing them down. And so if they can do that to Tyree Kill, it becomes more likely that Tua is going to lower his number. So I'll take both of them this week. Tyreek's number is also really high, 89 and a half. Again, you can have a really good game as a wide receiver and be under 90 receiving yards. My third favorite this week uh, was Kincaid, over 38 and a half receiving yards on Thursday night. So fourth favorite we're flipping to is Calvin Ridley. And we're going to pair it with my fifth favorite. They're going to go together as a correlation in Trevor Lawrence. Um, Pittsburgh has been dominated by wide receivers this season. They've given up, I don't want to say a monster game, they've given up four nukes in six weeks, but still every single week they've given up a very, very good game to wide receiver. Week one, Brandon Uke, eight for 129 and two touchdowns. Week two, Amari Cooper, seven for 90. Still a good game, not a nuke, but that's still a very, very good game. Uh, Devonta Adams in week three, 13 receptions, 172 yards, two touchdowns. Nico Collins in week four, seven for 168 and two touchdowns. Zay Flowers in week five, five for 73. So again, that's that second non-nuke game, but that's still a very good game. And then Puka in week seven after the week six bye, eight for 154. And I've been struggling all week to be like, okay, well, but who's it going to be, right? Because it's obviously going to be one of... Um, Ridley or Christian Kirk. It's going to be one of those two. It's not going to be like Tim Jones is the one that goes off. I don't know that there is a quote unquote correct answer. It's probably just going to be that like both of them are going to get multiple deep targets that one of them is probably going to hit on one of them, but that, you know, we just don't know which one it's going to be. But when you're looking at the names on that list, what stands out to me is boundary wide receivers, wide receivers that aren't operating mostly in the slot. You're more prototypical X wide receiver, just someone on the outside. They've actually been okay against slot wide receivers, but they're getting crushed to wide receivers that run a lot of routes on the outside. Ridley has been very up and down this season with a lot more downs than we were anticipating. But what has been consistent is that he is their boundary wide receiver. He is the person they want to line up in that X spot. And that makes him more likely than Kirk to take advantage of this matchup. Also, you look at his underdog projection. It's pretty low. I mean, 50 and a half receiving yards. He doesn't need to have seven for 100 and a score, which I think he can do this week. But he doesn't need to do that to go higher than 50 and a half. It's a pretty low number. He doesn't need to do anything crazy. And then Trevor Lawrence, 234 and a half. If one of these two, you're obviously hoping it's Ridley because you're taking Ridley here. But if Ridley, you know, is the one that hits, he has one of these great games against Pittsburgh that we're seeing every single week. It just makes it more likely that Trevor Lawrence is also going higher. So take advantage of that. Take both of them. If Ridley did not make your skin crawl, I've got one that definitely will. How about B. John Robinson, higher than 48 and a half rushing yards? Yes, I know that he laid a goose egg last week, but it's been pretty widely reported that he was sick. He wasn't really able to play last week. I don't know why they didn't put him on the injury report. They should have. They were supposed to, but they didn't. It wasn't. This is the main thing here. It wasn't that Arthur Smith just like doesn't like him anymore that he's like nope we're sticking with Patterson sticking with Algier those two will be used I'm not saying Bijan will go back to being featured but Bijan was sick last week that's why he only had the one carry uh now Arthur Smith remains a bad coach he's just like not a good coach in the NFL but there is one thing that we know about him and it's that he does not care about attacking opponents weaknesses if you've got a clear weakness on the other side he couldn't care less. He's going to stick to his game script, do what he normally does. We hit our 20 to 1 back in week two, attacking this exact matchup since good coaches, we know, will lean pass heavy versus Titans, and they will be successful when they do that because they're very good at stopping the run, very bad at stopping wide receivers. But again, Arthur Smith doesn't care about that. He's going to look at the other side and he's going to say, okay, they've got a rookie quarterback, we've got a really strong defense. Let's try and win like a 17 to 13 game, play conservative. Let's not air the ball out because even though we're very likely to be successful in doing that, 
what if Desmond Ritter makes a mistake? All we have to do really this week to win is not make a mistake. And so we'll lean really run heavy. So since Bijan's projection is brought down by the fact that he had the really bad game last week and the matchup is difficult and since teams usually lean very pass heavy in the spot underdog is going to project a more pass heavy game script for uh the falcons here so i would say okay well we know they're probably not going to do that they're probably still going to run the ball a ton we know last week was a fluke because he was sick and so we can kind of fade that noise and say okay higher than 48 and a half he doesn't need that many carries he can hit that on 10 rush attempts he's done that in every single week that he's been healthy this season but if he goes any higher than that i know the matchup is difficult Bijan can overcome that matchup as long as he's healthy to play this week which it appears that he will be 48 and a half is a very very low projection there take higher on that my next favorite is aj brown higher than 89 and a half receiving yards that's a very very high projection from underdog but uh this is the spot. This is like the spot for AJ Brown. I haven't projected this week for the most receiving yards in the league at 124 for a projection. He leads the league with a 50% target share versus man coverage. 50% that is absolutely nuts. And it's especially crazy because you've got Devonta Smith. You've got Dallas Goddard, DeAndre Swift. You've got great players on this offense. But when they see man coverage, 50% of the time that ball is going to A.J. Brown. Commanders run the second most man coverage in the NFL. They've allowed a 20% boost to yards per reception. That is first in the NFL. You just can't dream up a better matchup for A.J. Brown. That's why he had nine for 175 and two touchdowns against them earlier this year. Now, that's where the risk does come in because he was so good against them the first time. You have to think a smart coach will be like, okay, we should maybe sell out to stop him. And if they do that, the commanders, you know, any team is capable of doing that. I'll say the commanders, it's a little bit more tough if everyone's playing man coverage to totally do that. But if they decide to do that, you know, they're going to lean. The Eagles are going to look at Devonta Smith and be like, okay, well, you're also really good. And Dallas Goddard's also really good. So if we're triple teaming AJ Brown over here and you guys are facing, you know, single coverage with no safety help, we're still going to go to Devonta Smith because he's very, very good. Um, I just don't know that the commanders are totally going to do that. If you think that's going to happen, take higher and Devonta Smith for 48 and a half receiving yards, because if they sell it to stop Brown, Devonta Smith is definitely going higher than 48 and a half. I just can't imagine the commanders are going to have like a fundamental shift in their defensive philosophy for this one week. And that means they're going to run a ton of man coverage. And even if they're having extra safety help, it's still man coverage. AJ Brown is still at least a top three wide receiver in the NFL against man coverage. And honestly, like people would be talking a lot more about the season that AJ Brown is having had Tyreek Hill not been having like the greatest season ever. Like Tyreek Hill is on pace for well over 2,000 receiving yards. But A.J. Brown's still having a great year. He's third in yards per route run, second in receiving, first in ESPN's wide receiver model. His season-long pace is 126 receptions for 1,965 yards. Again, it'd be a much bigger story the season that he is having had Tyreek Hill not been having the greatest season that we've basically ever seen. So I like the hire on 89.5 in a smash spot for wide receiver having a phenomenal season. All right, let's go for the 21. Um, unfortunately, no games this week that I really see popping off to where we need to take like five players from one spot. So I'm going to recommend uh, correlating a few together. I'm going to add, or I'm going to put in basically my favorite of the week, the Nico Collins projection we talked about. That's going to start things off. And then I really do like the Lawrence and Ridley pairing. So we're going to start off with those three. Again, we need five for the 21. With that, you have two choices. You can add in either Gardner Minshew, lower than 225 and a half passing yards along with michael pittman jr lower than 63 and a half receiving yards or you can add in sam howell lower than 237 and a half passing yards with terry mclaurin lower than 56 and a half receiving yards my lean the one i'm gonna do is honestly i might just do both of them but uh the one i'm probably gonna do first is howell and mclaurin doing that pairing yes howell had um a really good game against the Eagles this season. It was honestly probably his best game of the year. 
But remember that 116 of his passing yards in that game came in the fourth quarter and overtime, and the Eagles only had the ball for three minutes and 45 seconds in the fourth quarter. That doesn't happen. Like, if there's one thing we know about the Eagles and the 49ers, those are two teams that when they get the ball up late, which they're probably going to be up late, in the fourth quarter, they have an incredible ability to drain the clock, to go on these seven, eight, nine-minute drives and just keep the opposing team on the bench and just not allow them to make a comeback effort. But it was the commanders who had the ball for most of the fourth quarter, and they ended up running 74 offensive plays. That's fairly unlikely to happen again. And so there really is like a solid amount of risk on the commander's side in this one, because also Sam Howell's on pace to just shatter the sacks record. Like every single game, he's getting sacked a million times. He had four or more sacks in all six weeks, four or more sacks, five or more in five of six. Sacks are drive killers. And so if he gets sacked a few times, you know, late in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, and they're not able to convert these drives, again, the Philly side is fully capable of running out that clock just because they didn't do so last time, just because they weren't able to go on these very long drives, uh, because the sacks didn't come at two inopportune of times for the commanders. That doesn't mean it can't happen this time around. It's also in this second divisional divisional matchup that we talk about sometimes being a little bit more difficult for quarterbacks. So again, I like Nico, Ridley, and Lawrence starting off with that core. And then I'd pair them with Howell and McLaurin, the lower on their passing and receiving yardage numbers. But I also don't hate Minshew and Pittman if you prefer doing that pairing. They got so lucky last week. I mean, we had the lower on them. They both went higher. But Minshew has a 60-yard touchdown to Downs in a busted play. And then the Pittman play where they like blew it over the middle of the field, a 75-yard reception. I mean, Pittman only had two catches. Like If you were going to take lower on 60 and a half, and you knew against Cleveland he only had two receptions, you're like, okay, I clearly hit that. But no, he has the 75-yard reception on the blown play there. Uh, over time, those were the correct picks, taking lower there. And it's the same this week. Like Their projections are still very, very high going against the Saints. The Saints have a very, very strong defense. Teams don't typically throw for that many yards against the Saints. And so Minshew to Pittman, I don't think should be as high in the projection as they are. I take lower in both of those. But again, I slightly prefer the Howell and McLaurin pairing. So those are 10 picks that I like this week. You can see at least 19 more. It's 19 right now. I'll probably add a few more this weekend. TheFantasyFootballAdvice.com. If you want to see those for free for the rest of the season while also getting a free square on underdog this week and getting your initial deposit doubled up to $500. All you have to do is sign up for your first underdog account today using promo code FFA. That free square is going to help you out a lot. It's going to be, you know, a higher or lower of half a yard. You're obviously going to take the higher and it's going to hit. Uh, and just getting your initial deposit doubled, it gives you a lot of breathing room early on just in case you have a few misses before you hit. So that'll do it for this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, have a hang the like button and have a subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Thanks for watching.